these two, Umar and Hamza, are embraced Islam. Are we all together? They, these two embraced Islam. And Abu Talib hasn't embraced Islam, hence why he's able to talk to Quraysh and get away with a lot of things. Are we all together? But for them, he's like A. And also Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So these people have embraced Islam. But Umar and Hamza are both feared individuals. وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأوال الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أم بعد we were in this, the second hijrah to uh, Ilan Habasha. The second hijrah to Habasha, we spoke about the Islam of An Najashi. Najashi embraced Islam, and we mentioned who Najashi was, and that the Prophet وسلم, he prayed on Najashi Salatul Ghaib. And he's the only person that the Prophet وسلم, prayed that Salah on. And inshallah ta'ala, when we come to the ninth year of the Hijriyah, we will talk about the Salatul Ghaib, some fiqh related matters to it, inshallah ta'ala, when we get there, and how the Prophet prayed it, alayhi salatu was salam. We also mention some of the benefits that were in Al Hijrah ila Al Habasha. The, some of the benefits that were in it, we spoke about it. Today I want to speak about أول وفد قدم على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم The first delegation ever to come to the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم Ibn Ishaq is going to tell us the story inshallah ta'ala so pay attention to it. Ibn Ishaq he says ثم قدم على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو بمكة the messenger والسلام, he was in Mecca and 20 men came to him 20 men they came to the Prophet والسلام, or close to that number and they were Christians so they came to the Prophet وسلم, because that's what they heard was what took place between Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and who? And Najashi. The conversation that took place, the Quran that Ja'far recited, and what Muslims believe about Isa ibn Maryam and his mother Maryam. So, this information, when it reached them, what they did was they said, Let's go to the source. Yani, let's, get, let's go to the Prophet. So they came to the Prophet masjid. So they found the Prophet was in the masjid. But what they did was they sat with him and they spoke to him. They asked him about his affairs. They said, Who are you? What are you pointing to? What do you want? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At the time that they are talking to the prophets and they are conversing with the messenger, Ibn Ishaq, he says, There were some non-Muslims from Quraysh that were sitting in their assembly around the Kaaba. We were just sitting there. And these 20 men, when they finished asking, asking the Prophet وسلم, the question that they had, they stood up and they wanted to leave. The messenger said, before you guys departure, is it possible that I could speak to you? So they accepted it. They said, no problem, speak to us. So what did the Prophet do? He took that as an opportunity, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he called them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the ways that the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, would call the people to the deen of al-Islam would be by reciting some verses. 
So he recited some verses of the Quran uh, onto them. And the reason to that is because a lot of them, they knew the Arabic language because these Nasara, they were Arabs that came from the uh, Arabian Peninsula, so they knew the Arabic language very well. And the Quran, my brothers and sisters, it's not just a miracle in its wording, but it's also a miracle in its what? Meaning, the meaning that it carries. So there is nothing more eloquent to give someone than the Quran. It penetrates the heart. It's fascinating because a few days back I saw a person uh, who was smoking and he heard Quran somewhere being recited. Was, was it from a car or somewhere? And so he smoked for a little bit and then he threw the cigarette on the ground and then he walked towards the place where the Quran was coming from and he went on his knees. It was an English man and he just like he was doing sujood just by what he heard. So the Quran, my brothers and sisters, it's penetrated and it's touched the hearts of so many people. It what? It touches the hearts of so many people. And a lot of people have embraced Islam just by hearing the Quran, like how beautiful it is. And, but also, my brothers and sisters, the meaning is something we should not dismiss. And Jumayr ibn Mut'im, I mentioned to you in Sahih al-Bukhari, and Imam al-Bukhari mentions in his Sahih, that the Messenger Ali والسلام, was in the Kaaba with Salatul Maghrib and he was praying, and the Prophet recited the verses uh, and those verses. And Jubair ibn Mut'im, he heard those verses and he came close and he listened to it attentively. And he said, My heart was about to fly from what I heard. And he said that was the first time waqara al-iman fi qalbi that iman fell into my heart was when I heard those verses. So the Prophet recited those verses on them. فَلَمَّا سَمِعُوا الْقُرْآنَ Look what Ibn Ishaq says. The minute they heard those verses read فَاضَتْ أَعْيُنُهُ بِنَ الدَّمْعِ They started to cry. They recite. And look what the Prophet didn't just recite Quran but he selected يعني for them, what is befitting for the place and the time. And again, it comes back to having knowledge of the Qur'an and, 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 and the meaning of the Qur'an, to be able to select what a person needs to hear at that time. So when they cried, they accepted the message of the Messenger به, and they believed in him. And they took his message and they realized this was what was missing from them. This is what they wanted. This is what they were looking for. This is their lost property. So they took it. As soon as they stood up and they wanted to leave, Abu Jahl saw them. He could see what was happening. He saw them crying. He saw them believing. So he came and he spoke to them. He said to them, not just him by himself, but with a Nafar bin Quraysh, a group of people of Quraysh were with him. He said to them, What a destructive, evil, treacherous group of delegation are you? Your people that you have left behind and you guys were on their religion, they sent you to go and look at this man Muhammad and see what kind of person he is. And instead of coming back with news for them and telling them what sort of individual he is, what do you do? You treacherous people. You believe in him and you take his message, he said. Then they said to him, Salamun alaykum. Peace be upon you, Abu Jahan. La jahinu. We're not going to be ignorant like you. And we, you're ignorant, we're ignorant, we're shouting at each other. We're not going to do that. Lana ma nahanu fihi. We will be upon what we're upon. Wala kum ma antum alayhi. And you can be upon what you want, Abu Jahan. And we have nothing more to say to you. We have found what we wanted, they said. And we won't leave it for you, Abu Jahl. Now I want you guys to take this. Abu Jahl is related to the Prophet. These people are not. They came from a far place. And when guidance, when Allah wants guidance for people, it doesn't necessarily always come from the closest people. It comes from what? People from far. A woman who was in a supermarket in France. She was in a supermarket 
and a, uh, she came to the cashier, she had her food and everything, and then she was waiting for it to be scanned. And the person who was scanning it was a Muslim lady. Okay, a Muslim lady was scanning it. Uh, and she said to her, and the, Muslim, and the, the other lady was wearing a niqab, she was fully covered. And the woman who was scanning is a Muslim lady. So she said, sister, you're embarrassing us. You're a source of shame to us. We came to this country to make business and to study and learn, not to bring our religion. Why would you do this to us? It is because of you and people like you that cause us problems. So go back to your country if you are so into your deen. Go to your country and uh, wear it there. So the sister, she looked around. When she realized no one was there, she lifted her niqab and she was a French lady. She said to her, you came here to take the dunya, we came here to take your deen. We bought your deen from you, and you took the dunya from us. Are we all together, brothers? She reminded me of the situation of Abu Jahl, and Abu Lahab, and these people who had Nabi Lai Muhammad with them in Mecca. Abu Lahab was related to the Prophet, he's his uncle, his, mater, his, his, his paternal uncle. And he is on the side of the enemies. And guess what? Other people, and Najashi and other people are coming into Islam and they're believing into the Salman al Farisi, Bilal, and others are embracing Islam. So, whoever Allah wants guidance for, guidance will come to them. So, these verses came down regarding these people. In Surah Al Qasas, the ayah came down and Ladila Atayna umul kitab and Minkabli umbihi umenu, where Ida Yutil Ali in Kalu Amena, those verses came down until. That when they hear idle speech and ignorance, what do they do? They turn away these people. That's what they did at the end. And they say, So those verses came down regarding them. And Hafiz ibn Kathir, he said regarding these verses, it's from Ayah 52 to Ayah 55 in Surah Al Qasas. He said that this ayah is talking about Yukhbirullah, Yukhbirullah Ta'ala, he informs, um, Allah is informing us, and ulama il awliya ibn ahl al kitab. He informs us of the scholars of the people of the scripture, min ahl al kitab, that they believe in the Quran. This verse is telling us that the people are well read in the Christians, and the well read Jews, when they really look at the Quran, they tend to accept or they tend to believe in the Quran. Even some of them just don't want to, but they recognize this is it. This is something. This is something. That's what Allah said in the ayah: "Allah dila atila umul kitaba yatlulahu haqqa tilawatihi ulaika yubinuna bi." The people of the Scripture, when they recite the Quran and they read it, they they believe in it and they affirm it. And for those people, and this is a message to any Christian. Or any Jew. Allah says, Their reward will be multiplied. It will be for what? Ibn Kathir, he said, Those people, it will be given to them the reward of believing in Christianity and also believing in the religion of Nabi Lahim Muhammad. They get two rewards. And then Imam al Bukhari even narrated that in his Sahih <laughs> that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Three types of people, you told the ajrahum maratani, the reward is given, given to them twice, it's multiplied for them. Rajulun min ahli kitab, a man from the people of the scripture, Christian or a Jew. Amala bilabiyyihi, he believed in his prophets. Okay? He believed in Musa or believed in Isa. Wa adaraka nabiyya and he met Nabi Allah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fa'amana bihi and then he believes in Nabi Allah Muhammad. He's going to be rewarded for what? <laughs> He's going to be rewarded twice. The first one is believing in who? He's Prophet and also believing in Nabi Allah Muhammad. And the second is Wa abdun mamlukun, a slave that is owned, who fulfilled, fulfills the what? Fulfills the rights of his, Jazakallah khairan, who fulfills the rights of his master and also the rights of his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will be rewarded twice. Also, 
a man who raises a girl, raises her very well, takes care of her, nurtures her, disciplines her, gives her good tarbiyah. When that girl grows up, he marries her off. This narration actually mentions if he is a female slave, he nurtures her and takes care of her, takes care of her, and then when she reaches that age, he frees her. Once he frees her, he asks for her hand in marriage so that she can make a decision. If she accepts it and then he marries her and he looks after her in that marriage, he gets rewarded. He gets rewarded twice. And another benefit that we take from the story is وَإِلَى سَبِعُ اللَّغُ وَأَعْرَضُ عَنُهُ وَقَالُوا لَنَا أَعْمَالُنَا وَلَكُمْ أَعْمَالُكُمْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ لَا نَبْتَغِ الْجَاهِلِينَ That is a quality that is the believers are seen to have. When you know someone's ignorant and they're speaking ignorance, you don't always respond. A lot of people think they have to respond to any and every person who speaks. Are we all together, brothers? Abu Jahl was ignorant. The things he was saying was ignorance. But what did they do? I said, we won't talk, we won't talk to you. And we won't entertain you. And also the characteristics of Ibadul Rahman is, وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّوْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا Ibadul Rahman are known for when they go by somebody who is ignorant and speaking foul language, they go by it with Salaam And it's smart. Two benefits that you take. They don't argue with the people, number one, and they don't make the person their enemy. You also don't want this person to be a, you don't want to create so many enemies, so you speak to them by saying, Salaamu Alaikum. Peace be upon you. Now we're going to go into one of the most saddest part of the seerah, and that is, مُقَاطَعَةُ قُرَيْشٍ بَنِي هَاشِمٍ وَحِصَارِ الشِّعْبِ We're now going to go into when Nabi Lai Muhammad and his people, Bani Hashim, and even Bani Muttalib, when they were boycotted. When Quraysh saw, Quraysh saw that our messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his message was spreading. Look at these people, 20 men, they came, they embraced Islam and they went back to their people. The numbers were growing. The religion was being loved and appreciated. And the people who were coming to Islam, the love that they had for Islam was very strong. They tried what they could do to prevent the message of an Islam from spreading. But they were not getting their way. So they went to Abu Talib and they said, we ask you for the last time this whole problem that we have is coming from one person. Who is it coming from? Nabi Lai Muhammad. Give him to us. Pass him over. We kill him. We end this whole issue. Once we kill him, you, Badu Hashim, don't bring any problems to us. You're happy with this decision for us. So Ibn Ishaq is going to tell, tell us the story, inshaAllah ta'ala. He said, فَلَمَّا رَأَتْ قُرَيْشٌ أَنَّ أَصْحَابَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قَدَ نَزَلُوا بَلَدَا so what they saw is, some of the Sahabas have gone to Habasha, they're taken care of, they're loved. The ruler of Habasha, al Najashi, also admires them. Now they realize things are out of control. They also realize within the Arabian Peninsula that the numbers are growing. Every now and then people are coming to the Prophet and they're taking his message. وَأَصَابُوا مِنْ بِهِ أَمْنًا وَقَرَارًا وَأَنَّ النَّجَاشِيَّ قَدْ مَنَعَ مَنْ لَجَأَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْهُ Umar ibn al-Khattabi qad aslam and also that Umar embraced Islam which we spoke about fakada huwa Umar and who Hamza were both in the Prophet's presence two feared men two men who had a voice in the gathering of Quraysh two members so now three people are missing from them they are big big names Umar Hamza Abu Talib these two, Umar and Hamza, are embraced Islam. Are we all together? They, these two embraced Islam. And Abu Talib hasn't embraced Islam, hence why he's able to talk to Quraysh and get away with a lot of things. Are we all together? But for them, he's like a... And also Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So these people have embraced Islam. But Umar and Hamza are both feared individuals. Will it make sense? They're feared. Hamza is very, very feared. And also Umar is. So now they're realizing that this is a problem. 
وجعل الإسلام يفشو في القبائل ابن إسحاق says that Islam is spreading amongst the tribes اجتمعوا وأكمل so Quraysh came together they came together and they wrote a con contract they got a letter and they wrote on that letter on the top they said Bismillah uh, Bismika Allahumma and they wrote their covenant and in there what they wrote was the following this is after Abu Talib said I'm not going to pass Nabila and Muhammad over to you guys you guys would have to kill me in order to get Nabila and Muhammad this is when they wrote the contract this letter what they wrote is the following things they wrote Allah you kifru ilayhim None of them, the Sahabas, or even Banu Hashim, and also by the by, guess who also followed in. As soon as they heard that Quraysh is boycotting Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib, they went to get on. Banu Muttalib, the Banu Sirah, they mentioned the people of the Sirah. They say Banu uh, Banu Muttalib, all of them, all in one one vote view, all of them to defend the Prophet. And we all together. And that's the people that Imam Shafi is from. The second group of people is the people the Prophet's from is Banu, Banu Hashim. Banu Hashim, only one man stood out of it, and that is Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab stood out and he was on the other side of Kufar Quraysh and he was against the Prophet. The, so now what they said is these two tribes, Banu Hashim. And Banu Muttalib, both of them will be boycotted. None of their women will be married. And none of their men would be married to any other tribe. That's a rule. We, no one's allowed to sell anything to them and no one's allowed to buy anything from them. Also, we have to take every means to make life very, very hard for them. No one's allowed to sit with them. No one is allowed to be, you, can, you can't be caught with sitting with any, with any one of them. No sitting, no talking, no conversation. We turn our backs, we boycott them, we let them die in hunger. If they come to the market, the, the food price is put so high that we know they can't buy. And we all together. And Abu Lahab, Allah, what, what did he do? He said to anybody who they come to, if they come to you and they want to buy something from you, put the price up. Put the what? Price up. If you really wanted to sell that thing, you come to me and I'll give you the money for it. Abu Talib, uh, not Abu Talib, Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab was saying that. They wrote the letter, they stuck it in the Kaaba. And they all promised to follow that paper. The person who wrote that letter with his hand was Mansur ibn Ikrimat ibn Amirin. Mansur ibn Ikrimat ibn Amirin was the one who wrote, uh, who wrote the uh, Sahifa with his hand. When he narrated the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa he raised his hand and he said, May Allah wa ta'ala destroy his hand. They said from that day onwards he could not raise his hand. His hand became dry like this. Couldn't eat from it, couldn't drink from it, nothing. لأن it was a صحيفة ظالمة. It was an oppressive letter that was written. So Abu Talib, he saw this and what they were willing to do to his nephew. He saw it. Abu Talib called Banu Hashib and he called Banu Muttalib. He said, come all of you. You can see what Quraysh has written. I call you all to defend this young man, Nabi Muhammad, with your blood, with your wealth, with everything that you guys have. Defend Nabi Muhammad. Let's defend him and what he calls to. Banu Muttalib said, Qawlan wahidan. All of us, we promise you. Abu Talib, we promise you that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is going to defend him, our blood and our wealth, everything. Banu Hashim, all of them said yes, and Abu Talib stood up, uh, Abu, Abu Lahab stood up, and he mocked the whole meeting, and he said, I'm not in this, and how dare you, who do you guys think you are? And he left the meeting angry. Abu Talib said, you can leave. They promised that, and they made that covenant. 
the, one of the most wealthiest people of the, that day was Khadija bin Tukwaylid. Khadija was very wealthy and she promised to spend every money that she has on her husband and his da'wah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she did not hold back and killed everything that Khadija had finished, perished. She had nothing to give to the Prophet and the companions. This woman, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was at the Mara'atul Salihah. Nabi Muhammad never forgot about her. He loved her so much that even when she passed away, her friends, the Prophet sallallahu used to stand up for them. Some of the narrations mentioned that the Prophet would take off his upper garment and he'd put it on the ground and he would say to him, sit on here. In respect for, for this woman, Badi Allahu Ta'ala. First. So this issue affected the Sahaba severely. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqasin, he mentioned, we were very hungry those days. We had nothing, no, nothing to eat. So we used to eat the leaves on the tree. They would get the leaves and they would eat from it. He said, one day I wanted to go to do my call of nature. Abu Nu'ay mentions in his Kitab Hilyatul Awliya wa Tabaqatul Asfiya. He went to go to do his call of nature, Sa'ad Nabi Waqas. He said, when I went to do my call of nature, I saw skin. And for me, that was the most juiciest meal ever. He said, I took that and I ate it for three days. He said, we, we would gather all the leaves that were edible and we would eat it, we'd put it in our drinks and we would try to eat it and try it. So our stomach, something is making it full. For three years, the Sahabas lived in a siege. Nothing to eat, not their food finished, everything. When they stayed for this hardship for very long, there was one person who was close to the Sahabas, who was the nephew of Khadija. His name was Hakim ibn Hizamid. And he remembered Khadija from her days when she had wealth and money. She took good care of him. So what he used to do was, he would place his uh, uh, food on his kabul and he would bring, he would direct it. By the way, they were sieged in a shi'ab, a valley, um, between a mountain. And so the uh, Hakim ibn Hizamin, he's, can he, Jazakallah khairan. Hakim ibn Hizamin, he's very concerned of what they could say to him, because it's dangerous. If, you, if they boycotted the Prophet, if they boycotted the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and he's caught feeding them, you can imagine when a country boycotts another country or puts them through siege and economic uh, sanctions. Huh? Anyone who's caught helping that country, giving them food, sah? what do they get? They get punished, penalized. Sah? Are we all together? So, the Hakim al-Hizam, what he would do is smart. He would get close to the valley and he would let his camel just walk by itself. Hoping that the camel will go towards the valley and he would, the food or whatever is wanted would go to them. So a lot of the times the Sahabas would take it like that. Until one day Abu Jahl saw him. So Abu Jahl said to him, Are you taking this food to Bani Hashim? For wallahi la dabrai. By Allah, I swear, you're not going to move from this position until I expose you to the people of Mecca and I tell them what you're doing. Then, Abu al-Bakhtari, Ibn Hishab, said to Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl, have you lost your mind? In the people, 
is his maternal auntie, uh, paternal auntie. How is he going to watch his auntie starve? Farid is his auntie. He has to feed his auntie. So don't let the anger that you have and the rage, he's only sending it to his Khadija and for her to eat. Then what Abu Jahl did was, he beat both of them up. And Abu Jahl had a very stark, strong feeling towards the situation. He wanted them to die out of Honda. With that being said, Nabiullah Muhammad would come out of the valley and he would come to call the people who were walking, the people in the market and everything to give da'wah to them. Alayhi salatu wasalam. They said he called day and he called night. He called some people privately and he called some people publicly. Never, he said, alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, I wasn't scared of anybody even those days. But the hardship is hardship. It, at this time, the noble companion Abdullahi Ibn Abbasin was born. He was born Fataratul Muqata'a. He was actually born in the Shi'f. The most knowledgeable man in the tafsir of the Quran from the companions. He is called Turjuman al Quran. And Imam al Dhabi said about him, Huwa Habr al Ummah. Habr means scholar. And he comes from the word ink. And he is the man of knowledge. Abdullah ibn Abbas, or Faqih ul Asr, or Imam ul Tafsir, Abu al Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abni Rasulullah, Al Abbas ibn Abd al Muttalib al Qurashi al Hashimi. He was born in the Shi'b of Bani Hashim before the migration three years. He stayed with the Prophet for how many? For only 30 months. That's it. Abdullah ibn Abbas only spent time with the Prophet. Um, with him <laughs> uh, because the rest he was very young when the Prophet passed away he was only 13 he let him narrated a lot they said he was a very handsome man Abdullah ibn Abbas and he was also a man who was very respected he had complete a very smart and clever man radiyallahu ta'ala he passed away in Ta'if, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Sanat Athabanin was Sittin Ali Hijra, when it was the 68th year of the Hijriya. Three years of suffering, three years of hardship, it ended with the decision of five men. And that's why people should never belittle that the good that they contribute for evil to end. We're now going to go into نَقْضُ الصَّحِيفَةِ وَإِنْهَاءِ الْمُقَاطَعَةِ How the... It ended the siege and the boycotting that was done to the Sahabas. Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib, they stayed in the valley for three years. And so one day, a group of wise, honorable men stood up. From them was Hishab ibn Amr ibn Rabi'a. He's the first one. He stood up. He's a man who is related to the people of Bani Hashim. And subhanAllah, these people today, when in Asaf is Shadid, we kind of dismiss it, but they understood the concept of Qaraba, a relative, and what they need from you, and all of that. They understood it. So what did he do? He walked towards a man by the name of Zuhair ibn Abi Umayyat al-Makhzumi. Zuhair ibn Abi Umayyat al-Makhzumi, his aunt, his, his, sorry, his uh, mother is Atika bint Abdul Muttalib. His auntie is what? Sorry, his mother is what? The Prophet's auntie. So when Hisham ibn Amr ibn Rabi'ah came to Zuhair ibn Abi Umayyat al-Makhzumi, he said to him, Ya Zuhair, Zuhair, are you happy to eat and to drink and to, be, we, we, to wear the best clothes and you can go and get married? And your maternal uncles, his mom is Atika, bint Abdul Muttalib, right? So the Prophet, Banu Hashim is what? Maternal, right? From his, his maternal uncles and aunties. 
Would you like your maternal uncles and aunties to starve, to have nothing to eat, to not be able to buy anything, can't get married, for them to suffer for three years? Do you, how do you go to sleep at night, he said How does he, your nuts allow you to do this? He said to him, he said to Hishab, I'm only one man. You're right. I see eye to eye what, you, what you're saying. I'm only one man. What can I do? What can I change? Look at Quraysh. Look at how much they are in number. I can't go against it. He said, Wait, Hak. I'm with you. Me and you are together. Two of us. He said, Okay, but two. Let's get a third person. He said, Okay, no problem. They went to Al Mut'im Al ibn Ali, Jubair's father. Al Mut'im ibn Ali. When they came to him, they said to him, Are you happy with two button of Quraysh? Both of them. When you say button, they all come from the uh, from who? Abdul Manaf, right? Are you happy with two tribes, big tribes of Abdul Manaf to all starve to death, have nothing to eat? Does that is that what your honor gives you? You can go to sleep with all of that happening? Wallahi, if you look at Kuffar al Quraysh, yeah, the issue of anafa that they had, and also they had this nafs which is nafs al abi, they didn't like oppression. It's quality, subhanAllah, that nowadays it's this is being replaced with ananiya, me, 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 individualism. Sah? You live for yourself, you're worried more about yourself. If I've got food, my children have it, who cares about the rest? Let them starve, let them be. That's not a way forward. That you only think about yourself and your family and your children, your loved ones. And you know another Muslim is suffering. It's going through hardship. So he said, Ya Mutrim, Akad Radita and Yahnika Bab Nani bin Bani Abdi Manafin, Wa Anta Shahibun Ala Dani Kamwa Fitul Quraish B. He said, Ama Wallah, if you guys see this to be the case, I'm only one bad. What can I do? They said, You fool. Two of us are with you. Now we're three. It's three of us. You're not alone. He said, okay, but we need to find a fourth person. They said, no problem. They went to... Zab'at ibn al-Aswad ibn al-Muttalib. When they came to him and they spoke to him, he said, what you guys are saying is the truth. I, I see eye to eye with what you're saying. It's correct. We should not watch Quray Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib destroyed in this manner. But again, I'm only one man. He said, listen, us three are with you. We're four of us now. He said, let's bring it to five and that's enough. He said, okay, no problem. They went and they spoke to... The fifth person. Abu al-Bakhtari, the one that Abu Jahl hit. Abu al-Bakhtari, remember Abu Jahl hit him? When him and who? Hisham, when he tried to take food to his maternal auntie. Abu Jahl hit both, so he had something in his heart already there. So five of them were ready to end this oppressive letter, but they had to think of a way to do it. They agreed that one person is going to go and call Quraysh. You just have to go to Mecca, the Kaaba, and scream. When everybody comes, you say what you believe about the country of Waraka. Someone is going to respond and, and go against you. One of us is going to get up and respond to him. And another one's going to come and another one's going to respond. Once we reach five, we're going to get more people to come with us. We're going to get more people to agree with us. That's the best way to do it. So they went. They made the agreement. They now said, who's going to stop? Who's going to take the first shot? Zuhair said, I'll do it. Zuhair ibn Abi Ubayyah. He stood up, he wore his prullah, dressed up nicely for the occasion, and he stood up. 
First he did his tawaf around the Kaaba seven times. And he came and he stood. And then he said to them, Ya Ahla Mecca, Ya Ahla Mecca. He called them by the people of Mecca. Are we going to eat food? The reason why he said Ya Ahla Mecca was because the Waraka came from Quraysh and they were the ones who were oppressing. He wanted if there were other people who are not from what? Quraysh, who were there, even you can voice your opinion. Does that make sense? So he, he said, Are we going to eat food and wear our clothes? And Banu Muttalib are destroyed, starving, hungry, suffering. Are we really going to do that? He said, Wallahi, I'm not going to move from this position until I go there and I rip that paper, the oppressive letter that was written. Abu Jahl, he said, he was sitting somewhere at the corner. He could see them say, scream and say what they want. And he said, Kadabta Allah. You have lied by the name of Allah. I dare you to touch that letter. I dare you to touch it and rip it. So the first person got responded to. Abu Jahl is a Venzila. It's hard to respond to him. Zam'a ibn al Aswad stood up and he said, Kadabta Allah. You are the liar, Abu Jahl. We agree with uh, what Zuhair is saying. We're all on the same page, Zuhair. And then Abu al-Bukhtari stood up and he said, Wallah, I agree with him as well. This letter should be. So people are thinking these people are agreeing with each other now. And then five of them, when they said it, al Mutaib ibn Adi also said the same thing. Then everybody started saying, yes, yes, yes. Rip it, rip it, rip it. He got taken down from the Kaaba, it was writ. Abu Jahan looked and he said, Amru dubbira bin Ha. I know this was planned last night, Saf. It wasn't, it didn't just take place right now. So the Arabs have a saying, when some, when a group of people agree with each other in a discussion, you say to them, Amru dubbira bin Ha. This matter was prepared against me yesterday. The minute that letter was writ, the Narration mentions a dude, a creature on this earth, ate the entire letter except the name of Allah. Because remember at the beginning they wrote Bismillah Allah, they wrote in the name of Allah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent his uncle, he said, uncle, the letter, all of it is being eaten except the name of Allah. So Abu Talib, he said, Abu Talib went and sent somebody to go and get the letter. When the letter was brought, it was as the Prophet said. Abu Talib said to the Prophet, and Ben Akhbaraka Bihada, who told you this? He said, Akhbar Ali Rabbi, my Lord told me. Are we all together? Which shows you, subhanAllah, Abu Talib saw so many things, right? But the guidance is in his hands. How though? Guidance is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hand. I'm going to stop there inshallah and ta'ala. I'm going to carry on next week. And, oh, by the way, next week there's not going to be a class. Again, I'm sorry, it's cancelled. But the week after, I'm going to carry on from there inshallah and ta'ala. So not next week, there's no class. But the week after, onwards, there's going to be a class inshallah and ta'ala. We're going to talk about the death of Abu Talib and the death of Khadija and how that impacted the Prophet's life, alayhi salatu wasalam. And what Quraysh did after this and boycotting, inshallah, we'll talk about it then. Anything I said that was wrong, I corrected from you, Shaytan, and Allah and His Messenger are both free from it. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa had astaghfiru kawatu ulik.